Thank you for coming tonight. Our guest speaker is Dr. Timothy Ball, PhD. Dr. Ball has studied climate academically and scientifically for over 40 years. After spending eight years studying meteorology and observing the weather as an air crew and operations manager in the Canadian Air Force. He earned degrees in Canada from the University of Winnipeg and the University of Manitoba, in England from the University of London and subsequently taught at the University of Winnipeg. Dr. Ball specializes in the field of historical climatology. The title of his new book, The Deliberate Corruption of Climate Science, and the body of his work reflect a firm commitment to science based on evidence. I'll introduce the professor with a quote from an article that he authored, featured on the What's Up With That website on March 21st of this year. Quote, it is one thing to waste time and money in the laboratory playing with climate models where they don't meet scientific standards. It is another to use their results as the basis for public policies where the economic and social consequences are devastating. Please welcome Dr. Timothy Ball, who along with author Mark Stein has had the experience of being sued by the infamous hockey stick wielder, Michael Mann. Dr. Ball. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, evening. Notice I didn't say good. Everybody's telling us what to think. Make up your own mind whether it's good or not. Who am I to tell you? And, and, uh, and of course, what I'm going to do tonight is give you a biased presentation. And my argument for that is that all you've heard up to now is a bias. And I'm going to present you what you haven't heard, and you can put the two biases together and, and draw your own conclusions. All right? That's the whole objective of, of this evening. And biases, as I said, are only a problem if you're not aware of them. The same as problems. Once you've defined the problem, you're halfway home to solving it. And so that, that, of course, is the issue here. Is there a problem, and how do we define it? You hear academics talking about a paradigm shift. What are they talking about? They're talking about a society deciding to look at something in a very different way than they have previously. All right? The one, uh, of course, that we're talking about tonight is environmentalism. And people say, oh, you don't care about the environment. I care more about the environment than anybody I know. I've served on commissions, and I've set up boards of, of soil conservation, water conservation, all sorts of attempts to deal with environmental issues. But see, what happens with a paradigm shift is that there's a few people that look at it and say, hey, there's an opportunity for me here. And the opportunity is either financial or political or worse, both. Okay? And so those those people grab that idea and exploit it. And I'm going to suggest to you that environmentalism was an absolutely necessary new paradigm. But what happened was a group of people grabbed it and took the moral high ground with it and used it to control everybody else. They, have, they, they are in fact on the verge of, the environmentalists are on the verge of destroying environmentalism because the public are getting fed up with it. They're getting fed up with what I call eco-bullying. They're getting fed up with being pushed around. And, and so, of course, the problem is that if they push back and they lie to them too much, the public will say, we don't believe anything you tell us. Then real issues won't get dealt with. That's the danger. It's, it's in that old Aesop's fable about the, the wolf, cry, cry wolf. And we're on the verge of that with environmental issues right now. And it's starting to happen because People are seeing the cost in jobs, the cost in uh, damage to society, structures of society, and so on. So they're starting to push back a little bit. It's one of the reasons we're here talking tonight. And so paradigm shifts, as I said, very essential. I don't care if you can't make any sense out of this. This is a simplified diagram of the weather with the sunlight coming in at the top here and heat coming in from the oceans and how it all gets mixed up. When you stand outside, you experience the weather. That is the sum total of everything from cosmic radiation in deep space to heat coming off the bottom of the oceans and everything in between. All right? It is what engineers call a white noise. It's as if you were standing outside of a football stadium and you're 100,000 people, that's a white noise. And what they're trying to tell you is that we know enough about the climate and the weather to be able to pick out individual noises in that, in that stadium. 
And I'm here to tell you, we don't and we can't. But what have they done? They've picked out one of those individual noises, and I want you to think about this. They've chosen CO2. Why did that become the focus? It's such a minuscule part of the total atmosphere, as we'll see. So there must have been some reason that it became the focus of everything. And that's what we, we need to talk about here, what we need to understand that you haven't been shown. Now, it is, of course, well, I'll just flip back for a second, but it is, of course, in the graph here, it's in with atmospheric composition. But that's only one gas in the atmosphere. There's nitrogen and oxygen, which are 98% of the, of the atmosphere. And then there are what are called the greenhouse gases. And this is where the deception begins, because this shows you the greenhouse gas percentages. But look at this, here's CO2, 4% of the greenhouse gases. What's the biggest greenhouse gas? The most important greenhouse gas is water vapor. It's 95%. You know that here. You know that if you've got an evening with these clear skies and the heat escapes, the temperature's going to drop. You're going to get frost probably in the spring or the fall. But if you've got high humidity and you've got clouds around, the temperature stays up because the water vapor is acting in trapping and holding the heat in. You go to Insula in southern Algeria in 1943, they recorded a temperature change. It was minus 3.6 at midnight, and by noon the next day it was plus 52 degrees Celsius. That is a phenomenal change of temperature. Why? Because there's no water vapor in the desert. The CO2 makes no difference whatsoever. No difference whatsoever. But you see, this is what they wanted you to focus on, and that's the question we need to ask ourselves here tonight. And here, here's how it gets misinterpreted. There's that same pie chart, and this is right off of ABC News' website that the, the, the young people go and get. It says, this graph shows the distribution of greenhouse gases in Earth's atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is clearly the majority. It doesn't even show water vapor. 95% of what are greenhouse gases is left out of this graph. This is 100% wrong. And yet there it is on ABC News' website. And then you start to understand why the people are confused about what's going on, how easily they are misled. I wanted to get a graph uh, that was long enough to cover everybody in the room. This is uh, 420,000 years. <laughs> I, uh, you, you know, when I, when I joined the Canadian Air Force, one of the old sweats said, you know, if you can't take a joke, you shouldn't have joined. <laughs> And I didn't realize how serious he was till I got assigned to the Arctic Search and Rescue Squadron. And the oldest air crew member we had was 36. The youngest airplane we had was 43. <laughs> right? And we had an old DC-3 that had been used for towing targets during the war. And the whole frame had been stretched out. The plane was three inches longer than when it was built. The problem was that meant a three inch gap in the door which when you're flying search and rescue in the Arctic is not exactly a nice thing to have. But uh, anyway, um, 420,000 years, well if it doesn't cover your age, it covers your mortgage, all right? So we're all right there. What this shows, this came out in 1991, and it was presented as proof that CO2 was driving temperature. Here's the current temperature of the Earth over here. And the, the blue line is the temperature, the red line is CO2. And the French uh, researchers that brought this out to Petit and Jauzel, and but they were warning. They said, don't rush to judgment on this graph. Because if you look at this graph, when it's in a book, that's about four inches of graph that's covering 420,000 years. How much detail can you see? The answer is virtually nothing. Okay. Well, it, within five years, and, and they were saying, oh, this is proof. This is what these, these people that were using climate for a political agenda, they said, this is proof that the temperature is driving, or CO2 is driving temperature. We knew within five years that it showed exactly the opposite. That the temperature changes before the CO2 changes. But what's the whole fundamental assumption that they make? They say, oh, CO2 goes up, the temperature will go up. 
That doesn't occur in any record anywhere in the world at any time in history. Nowhere. In fact, exactly the opposite happens. So the fundamental assumption they make about CO2 and temperature is wrong. But they blithely carry on because they know the public don't know that and don't understand that. So you can see that here. But by the way, well, I'll, I'll show you another graph. This, this, um, this shows you uh, 600 million years of the Earth's history. Uh, I love it when they come on the radio and they say, oh, it's the hottest day ever. <laughs> oh, boy, am I glad I lived long enough to see this. <laughs> and I like to phone in and say, do you really mean ever? Well, no, it's a government record. Oh, oh, that. Now, how did we ever survive before there was government? My goodness, this is amazing. And, and, uh, and of course, that's something that you've got to look at. What this shows is the current level, CO2, is the red line. And here we are at the current level, 400 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. And Al Gore tells you that's the highest level we've ever had. Look at this graph. It is, in fact, the lowest level we've ever had. Okay? And in fact, you could argue, looking at here, the last 300 million years, that the CO2 level has averaged around 1,000 to 1,200 parts per million. Three times what we've currently got. And do you know how we know that's important to the Earth? Because if you go to the greenhouses uh, on the co coast here, the commercial greenhouses, they pump up to 1,200 parts per million of CO2 to get the plants to grow more vigorously. In fact, you could, and, and Dr. Idso has done 30 years of research showing that increased CO2 increases the yield of the plant. And, and also, by the way, reduces the amount of water it uses. So um, I think that that's 300 million years of evolution of plants to an <laughs> optimum level of about 1,200 parts per million. So you could argue, say, the plants are malnourished at 400 parts per million. Um, here's another interesting thing, uh, about 480,000 or 480 million years ago, 438 million sorry, years sorry, uh, when the Democrats were still in power. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Remember, if you can't take a joke. <laughs> but here, here's, here's the temperature, the blue line is the temperature. This is the Ordovician Ice Age. 438 million years ago. An ice age. But what's the level of CO2? 4,000 parts per million. And they're telling you at 400 parts per million, we're in runaway potential of global warming. The evidence doesn't support anything that they're saying. Nothing. But they still push that agenda. Climate change. The climate solvents change. Saying that the climate's changing is like saying women have babies. Tell me something I don't know. But of course the public have no idea how much the climate changes, how dramatically and quickly the climate changes, and I'll show you that very briefly. So for example, in my short lifetime, from 1900 to 1940 the global temperature was going up. And then from 1940 to 1980 it went down. And from 1980 to 1998, it went up. And from 1998 to now, it's going down. That's in my short lifetime, four climate changes. I survived them all. <laughs> and the lack of CO2 has nothing to do with my lack of hair. <laughs> By the way, I, I like to tell people, you're looking at someone that would love to have a bad hair day. <laughs> okay, I, I shouldn't get too flippant about this, but I'd love to have, bring some humor into it because if I could name the human species, by the way, you know what I'd call us? Homo humorous rumorous, right? Because we need a sense of humor and we love gossip, right? Doesn't that sum up the human person right there? Uh, but here, this shows you that same ice core record from Antarctica. Here's the current temperature and the temperature goes down to the ice age in here and then up. So these peaks are what we call interglacials. You should be darn grateful we live in an interglacial. <laughs> Canada is certainly grateful. It wouldn't have existed 20,000 years ago. All right. And so when you look at this, and then again remember what they're telling you. Oh, it's, war it's warmer than it's ever been. 
but look at the previous interglacials, how warm they were. And you go back to 120,000 years. Barney Rubble wasn't driving a car. Okay? It's got nothing to do with CO2. But what I want you to notice is look at how quickly the temperature rose, but how quickly it also drops. Look at the variability. That's about 40 degrees Fahrenheit or more of variability of temperature in each of those ups and downs. That's normal. But you've been led to believe that change is not normal, that what's going on is not normal. You'll have a hard time figuring out what you're looking at here uh, because it's a view of the world that you very rarely see. What you're doing here is you've got the North Pole in the center. You're looking down on the North Pole. It's complicated by the fact that here, this is 18,000 years ago, here's the massive Laurentide ice sheet covering most of Canada and northern US, the Greenland ice sheet, the Eurasian ice sheet. That's just 18,000 years ago. Just 18,000 years ago. And, 18, 000, and here, here's the North American picture, right? And in fact, uh, we, we had a, an ardent Canadian uh, nationalist because what happened is as this glacier advanced, it scraped all the soil off of Canada and deposited it across the northern states. <laughs> and, and he argued that we should have got that back as part of the NAFTA agreement. <laughs> that, that, was, that was our soil that you could. But, but you, can, you can see, now, where did the water come from for all that ice? The answer is it came from out of the oceans. So 18,000 years ago, the oceans were 420 feet lower than they are today. Right? You wouldn't need a Washington ferry. You wouldn't, wouldn't need BC ferries. Right? You'd all interconnect it. And um, you can see how much the... Um, this, this is uh, 18,000 years ago, and you see the sea level, and look at the rapid rise in sea level in a period of about 6,000 years. Oh, they're telling Al Gore, oh, the, the sea level's going to rise, it's going to be the end of the world. Panicking you with that. And then, so you see from, a, from here about 15,000 years ago up to 8,000 years ago, that's when the dramatic increase in sea level, so 427 feet uh, approximately. For the last 8,000 years, sea level has increased very, very slightly. And this is another problem. You see, they tell you, oh, you hear another story about Antarctica, and oh, it's going to melt and crash into the ocean, and the sea level is going to rise. Hang on a minute. Remember the old grade 8 experiment when you put a glass of water and you put an ice cube in it? And it was, what will happen when the ice cube melts? Most people think the water will spill out over the edge of the glass, and it's not right. Some will say, well, the, the water level will stay the same. They're not right either. In fact, the water level will go down. Right? Because when water freezes into ice, it expands. The ice occupies more space than the water that formed it. So if the Antarctic and Greenland ice caps were to melt, most of them are already under, under below sea level. So that, in fact, wouldn't affect sea level. In fact, it would cause a decline in sea level. But they don't tell you that. Right? So, and then, if you're standing on the shore, like you're down in the Gulf of Mexico, the Louisiana coastline there, you say, oh, there, oh the sea level's uh, coming in. It's, it's advancing in. Do you know what's happening there? The land is sinking. The land is sinking. Because you can stand on a shoreline, and if the sea level line is moving, you don't know if it's because the water's rising or falling or because the land rising or falling. And I can show you places all around the world. Hudson Bay in Canada is getting smaller at a very rapid rate. A place called Sloops Cove, where the Hudson Bay Company used to tie up their, their sailing ships, is now above water, even at high tide. And that's in just 200 years. That's geologic change. That's tremendous. So change, very dramatic, going on all of the time. This, this gives you an illustration about the sea level. This, this is a, a graph of about 10,000 years. And you notice what I'm doing is taking very long records, and then we're looking at shorter and shorter time periods. This is from Greenland. This is ice core data, the temperature from Greenland over the last 10,000 years. Here's the current temperature over here. It's been warmer than the current temperature for most of the last 10,000 years. But again, they don't tell you that. 
It is that warming that caused the ice to melt. It's called the Holocene optimum. Optimum, warmer temperatures. Okay? So when, when you look at that, and I've got an arrow here, and I'll, I'll tie that in for you here. This is a photograph that I got from Professor Ritchie from the University of Toronto. Um, he's passed away now. But what it shows here, this is a white spruce, Picea glauca. And it's radiocarbon dated at around 4,940 years old. And yet it's 100 kilometers north of the current tree line. To have a tree grow to that dimension in that latitude, the temperature has to be two to three degrees warmer than currently. All right? And they're saying, oh, two to three degrees warmer is going to be the end of the world. How did the polar bear survive this? How did the polar bear survive this? Well, we'll look at that question because, of course, that's one of the things that they want to play on people's emotions with. Extinction. Oh, then we've got to find, a, a, like the world wildlife, we're all going to have the panda. It's got to be nice fuzzy fur ball with nice big round. I tell you, I've seen those polar bears. <laughs> These, they're hunting machines, killer machines. Okay. But let me, let me tell you that, animal, that, by the way, animals are not going extinct. This is the, one of the great myths. In fact, it's estimated we've only found, located, and identified 35% of all the plants and animals on the planet. Only 35%. They found an animal the size of a small cow in the Vietnam forest about four years ago, and they had a war there. <laughs> How did the cow escape the war? No, I mean, mm. <laughs> But think about the extinction thing. Let me tell you, there are a lot of animals that are doing very well, thank you very much. Pigeons, seagulls, coyotes, snakes. Have I mentioned any you like yet? Oh, you see, it's a very emotional thing. You know, you've got to have those nice white... And, and by the way, let me give you an idea of how distorted this can get. One of the things we did in the East Coast when I was anti-submarine was we had to watch and monitor the seal hunt. Okay, and they brought Brigitte Bardot over and said, all oh, these horrible people are killing the young seals. It was their livelihood. And it was a horrible life, very, very harsh life. And, and uh, they, they set up Brigitte Bardot, by the way. They said, oh, if you're going, the Newfoundlanders said, and they're wonderful people. They said, if you're going out in the ice, you've got to wear the right clothing. Here's some good boots and some good pants to wear. And then when she came back, they told her they were seal skin boots. And this. <laughs> <laughs> she just went berserk. But the, the other thing is, of course, as you know, Greenpeace decided they were going to defend uh, the seals. And uh, so they, of course, the name Greenpeace. The Newfoundlanders, with their wonderful sense of humor, they said, we are going to protect the cod, because the seals are killing the cod. So they formed a group called Cod Peace. <laughs> but, but here you can see, as I said, you can see what, how warm it was when that spruce tree uh, was formed. And this is looking at, at the, the last thousand years of, of European temperatures. Here's the current temperature. And going back, you can see to the Little Ice Age, around 1680, the nadir of temperatures then. And when you look here at Dickens' winter, what do you think of when you think of Charles Dickens? Do you think of, of Christmas Carol, snowy winters, harsh conditions, workhouses? first nine years of Dickens' life in London, it snowed every single winter and the snow stayed on the ground for three months. You don't even get a vestige of that today. Nobody's arguing that warming hasn't occurred. The question is, how long has the warming been going on? Well, the most recent warming, as I said, is from the Middle Ice Age. You don't understand the fur trade unless you understand how cold it was in the 17th century in Europe. I gave a talk to a group, when, and it was a French historian of fur, uh, French clothing. You think you had a boring job. Right? And he came up after and he said, you know, I was reading about French aristocrats wearing fur underwear. Right? And he said, I couldn't make any sense out of it. And he said, now when I find out how cold it was, I said, hang on a minute, these are French aristocrats. Maybe it wasn't the cold. <laughs> but if I tell you that it, if I tell you that in 1704 they had ice on the Mediterranean in the south of France, you start to understand how cold it was, okay? And, and uh, so, 
Then you've got this medieval optimum, this very warm period around 1,000 years ago. Um, that had significant effect in North America here. For example, the drought all through the Four Corners and that whole Southwest, the Anasazi people, the impact of that drought. And by the way, they migrated. This is another thing that you need to understand. People react and respond and migrate. Absolutely amazing how much people migrate. In fact, there are Navajo and Hopi words in the language of the Dene people in the High Arctic even today. Of course, that's been transmitted by those people migrating. Uh, also, by the way, because of the tobacco trade. They took tobacco up there. But of course, during this warm period in Europe, and they consider 12th century the optimum century in Scottish history. Why? Because it was warm and they could grow crops. Because this is one thing we must never forget. Remember I talked about getting rid of the leaders that with the food supply failed. Surplus food is surplus time, and with that surplus time, you can create any kind of economy you want. And all of the people throughout history, and the, the founding fathers, Jefferson talked about how important agriculture was as the fundamental part of your economy. If you can't feed yourself, you're at the mercy of everybody. And, and so, of course, they, they were able to grow lots of food, and that left lots of time when they could build Gothic cathedrals. They had the manpower, the people that were available to do it because somebody was producing enough food for, for themselves and for other people. And by the way, one of the great, you talk about American exceptionalism, no nation in the history of the world has ever produced as much food as the United States. Where now you've got 2% of your population producing enough food to fill, feed your own people and to export. But of course what that means is that a lot of people then are in the cities and don't understand the food supply and all the problems that engender with that. But no, no nation has ever achieved what the US did in terms of food production. Uh, when, when you look at um, the other side, here we go. Uh, during the Little Ice Age, this is a painting of the Thames of London. In 1683, there was three feet of ice on the Thames in London, England. You can't even imagine that today. And again, as I said, think about the fur trade, the demand for furs and what this meant. You can see here, here they're working. This is the old London Bridge before it fell down. And, and so you can see the implications of that. Um, there's lots, uh, I, I do a whole uh, show of, of climate and art relating how the climate depicts the art through time. This is the most recent temperature of the world. It's a composition of, of four different temperature rec records, NASA and, and so on, and the satellites from the University of Huntsville at Alabama. And what it shows is from 1979, the temperature is going up. And then, of course, since 1998, um, it's changed. And, of course, when it was going up, they called that global warming. And then from 1998 onwards, they had a problem. Because Mother Nature wasn't going along with what they were forecasting. And so instead of going back and saying, our science is wrong, they moved the goalposts. And they called it climate change. Okay? And if you want proof that that was deliberately done, here, and I hope you can see this all right, here's a quote from some emails that were deliberately leaked on these corrupt scientists. And it says, uh, the CRU, the Climatic Research Unit, the IPCC, in an email from the Tyndall Center on the UAA campus said, in my experience, global warming freezing is already a bit of a public relations problem with the media. Right? People were starting to make jokes about, oh, you know, <laughs> where's that global warming? Right? I, I like to tell people it's another undelivered government promise. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so, uh, and then, this Swedish alarmist, Bo Yellen, he said, I agree with Nick that climate change might be a better labeling than global warming. They deliberately changed the labeling. And so you start to see what's going on. That their global warming scare, the evidence, this by the way, their hypothesis was CO2 goes up, the temperature will go up. But if CO2 was continuing to go up, the temperature wasn't going up anymore. This is what Huxley said a hundred years ago is a, the great bane of, of, of science, a wonderful hypothesis destroyed by an ugly fact. <laughs> right? And so you, you had this difficulty. And here's the graph. 
Taking that from 1998 on, you can see the temperature sli declining slightly. Look what the CO2 is going. It's not supposed to happen. Not supposed to happen, but that's what's going on. And so again, the cartoonists strike it. And here it says, uh, the elephant in the room, the 17-year cooling trend. Okay, and here's a scientist saying, why is everybody snickering? Global warming science. Well, they kind of try to come up with all kinds of excuses about what's wrong. Oh, it's in the deep ocean and all the rest of the nonsense that, that they've gone on with. The problem is their computer models are wrong. They don't work. Uh, every prediction they've made using these computer models has been wrong. And I mean everyone, every single one. And this is, the, this is part of the difficulty. This is how the computer models are created. They divide the world up into grids. And the, the smallest grids are like this one is three, three degrees latitude by three degrees longitude. That's a large area. But here's the problem. 85% of the world, we have no weather stations. 70% of the oceans, virtually no weather stations. 20% of the land is mountains. 19% is desert. No weather stations. Most of the weather stations are concentrated in eastern North America and western Europe. And so, to, what are they building these models on? And the answer is, they create a model for each grid, and they guess at what the temperature might be in that grid. Because this is the point they've reached, because they haven't got the data. They create a computer model that tells them, oh, here's the data. They take that then as real data and put it into another computer model, when it isn't real data. That's how corrupted this has become. And, and so you can see. And by the way, you think we haven't got any data on the surface. When you get above the surface, we've got even less. We've got even less. We know virtually nothing about what's going on in, in the, the atmosphere from the surface up. The inability to forecast. Well, here's those graphs of temperature and the change from warming to climate change. This is the surface temperature. This is the satellite leveling off. This is their forecasts. But you see, in 19, after 1990, their forecasts were so wrong, they changed the name again. They stopped saying we're doing predictions, we're doing, we're doing projections. <laughs> All right? And so they came up with they brought a low projection, a best projection, and a high projection. Even the low projections are wrong. And would you, would you buy anything from anybody that was wrong with every previous forecast they've told you? But that's what they expect you to do. At some point, you say, sorry, you've been wrong. I'm, I'm not listening to you anymore. And, and so you can see uh, the problems that, that have developed. I, I, I got to brag about the Canadian model is the worst of all of them, by the way. <laughs> and Canada has been very deeply involved in this, unfortunately, through the government from the start. And this is the, this is the multi-model predictions from all from 23 countries. Here's the actual temperature. The Canadian model, as I said, was worse than any of them. Its, its projections were the worst. And that's not surprising, because see, one of the things that everybody knows, if you can't forecast the weather two, three, four days from now, how can you possibly tell me what it's going to be like 40 and 50 years from now? You can't. Right? And I, like, I like to tell the farmers that. Phone Environment Canada and say, what's it going to be like a year from now? And say, oh, we don't do long-term forecasts. And then phone them the next day and say, what's going to be like 50 years from now? Warmer? <laughs> I've got to disconnect here. Time to disconnect here. This is a, a, and, and this is the amazing part. By the way, if you, you know what, I know what's going on in the US, the VA and all of that stuff. Mary McCarthy said several years ago that bureaucracy is the rule of nobody. It is the modern form of despotism. And I think you see that playing out everywhere. The bureaucrats are, have become completely unaccountable. And they, of course, then have enormous power to come in and do whatever they want with you. This, but here this shows you the arrogance of power that they have. Because the Canadian government, Environment Canada, they, they give a three months, six months, 12 month forecast. And then they publish how often that forecast has been accurate in the last 30 years. Well, if I tell you that this is a map, it's a 12-month accuracy forecast. 
the gray is less than 40% accuracy. In other words, you could be better with tossing a coin. And the dark blue less than 45%. The average accuracy for all of Canada is 41.5%. Would you buy anything from somebody like But what's amazing is they publish this on their own website. Say, Look how bad we are. Oh, but keep sending the chat. <laughs> it is, it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. And I'll, I'll show you. Um, this is again the Canadian. This was their <coughs> forecast for the winter of 2013, Eastern Canada, above normal. <laughs> they couldn't have been more wrong if they tried, <laughs> right? And but then when you look at the accuracy of, of their forecasts over that three-month forecast, it's 48 percent, less than chance. And you know what? If you say tomorrow is going to be the same as today, you've got a 63% chance of being right. And the governments achieve about 70%. Well, you're paying a lot of money for that extra 7%, I'll tell you. It is really quite amazing. And just to make you feel a little better, your own NOAA does the same thing. They do their monthly or three months, six month forecast, and then they do a, a test. They test the, to, to determine how accurate their forecasts are. Um, you can see that you're, you're at 57%, so pretty good, right? <laughs> Way better. I mean, 57% accuracy is just incredible. And when you go and look at what it costs you, what those agencies cost you, it's phenomenal. I want to show you this quote. This is from a person who was in, he's a me me meteorologist and physicist. His name's uh, uh, Klaus Eckhart Plus. And this is what he said about a year ago. Ten years ago, I simply parroted what the IPCC, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, told us. One day, I started checking the facts and data. First, I started with a sense of doubt. But then I became outraged when I discovered that much of what the IPCC and the media were telling us was sheer nonsense, was not even supported by any scientific facts and measurements. To this day, I still feel shame that as a scientist, I made presentations of their science without first checking it. Scientifically, it is sheer absurdity to think you can get a nice climate by turning a CO2 adjustment knob. That is a phenomenal statement for a scientist to make. That is absolutely outstanding, uh, uh, amazing, because it contradicts everything that you're being told. Totally contradicts everything you're being told. <coughs> But what are they exploiting? They're exploiting your lack of knowledge, and I've already shown you some things that most of you weren't aware of. And of course, the old sky is falling, chicken little uh, syndrome. And one of the things they tell you is, oh, there's, there's going to be some more severe weather. We're having more severe weather. And of course, they want to do that because they, and they want to, uh, to play on the perception people have. Because it seems like every time you turn on the TV, oh, here's another severe weather event. And Governor Brown with his drought in California and all the rest of it. But let me tell you how this works. If you're introduced to somebody for the first time, it seems like after that, every time you turn around, there they are. They were always there, but they were just not part of your world or your perception. So what's happening now is the media have decided that weather events and notice by even Fox News, the hyperbole, what are they going to do when they run out of hyperbolic words? I mean, they don't have just a weather report. It's extreme weather. It's extreme weather. Right? Shaking. That, by the way, that's why I think they work. They get you shaking so hard, all the money flies out of your pockets and they go around <laughs> picking it up. So you think, oh, I, I've watched so many severe weather events. Got to be true. But here's a plot of tropical storms and hurricanes from 1971 to the present. Show me the increase. Do you know the year when most people died from tornadoes in the US? 1905. 250 people died in 1905. And there weren't that many people living in Tornado Alley at that time. I could make a cruel joke about not many trailer parks either, but I wouldn't do that. <laughs> So you, you, you can see this, and um, here's another example of how they exploit it. This is the U.S. tornadoes from 1950 to 2007. You say, well, there it is. Oh, yeah, tornadoes increasing. 
But let's look at the facts. Population grow growth has resulted in more tornadoes being reported. You know that, that Environment Canada is not allowed to say that there was a tornado unless somebody saw it? <laughs> right? Got to see it to report it. So you've got more people, they're going to see more tornadoes. Advances in weather radar, particularly the deployment of about 100 Doppler radars across the U.S. in the mid-90s, has resulted in a much higher tornado detection rate. The increase. So suddenly when you start to look at and explain this data, you see that that increase probably doesn't exist at all. And tornado damage surveys have grown more sophisticated over the years. Do you know who made one of the most honest statements recently, believe it or not, was Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett's very heavily invested in insurance. And he said, I've been looking at our records and we've got no increase in claims for quite some time. And what's significant about that? Who would benefit more by saying, oh, it's terrible, you buy more insurance than the guy that owns the insurance company? Okay. It's the same way as Warren Buffett pushing the railway and opposed to the Keystone Pipeline because he owns the railway lines across northern U.S. Right? And so you, you start to look, what, what is that? Some, somebody very wisely said, follow the money. Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't it? Uh, yes, something like that. And here, here you've got, this is the U.S. annual count of, of strong to violent <coughs> tornadoes, 1954 through 2012. There's no increase, simply no increase. And, and uh, so you, you start to see uh, what's going on. But this is one of the most interesting ones for you to understand, because what do they tell you? Oh, the Arctic ice is melting, the polar bears are dying, and all of this, whoa, oh, scare, scare, scare. And, and uh, this is, uh, again, looking down on the North Pole. This is for April of 2013, and it shows approximately 15 million square kilometers of ice is, is the red. And then this is the same diagram by September of that year, and there's the Arctic ice by September, that every single year, approximately 10 million square kilometers or 3.9 million square miles of ice melt every year. In other words, an area the size of the continental US. That is normal, normal. But how many people are aware of this? The answer is virtually nobody. And that's why they chose these things, because they, they know you don't know. And let's put that in some perspective. That means that it melts in approximately 150 days. So 3.9 million square miles melting in 150 days, that's 25,900 square miles a day. That's normal. I'd love to see a headline in USA Today that says, an area equal to West Virginia <laughs> melts it today, because that's what happens. That's normal. But let me show you how they play the game. A few years ago, they said, oh, more ice melted in the Arctic this year than last year. An area the size of Texas. Oh, that, so big, Texas. Oh, my, I, my favorite joke, by the way, the Texan talking to the New Hampshire farmer, and the New Hampshire farmer said, how big is your farm? And the Texan said, oh, it takes me about two and a half days to drive around in my pickup. And the New Hampshire farmer thought for a minute and said, I got a pickup like that, too. <laughs> But of course, you see, when you say, well, what's the area of Texas as a function of, of the continental US? It's about 4%. So it's not significant at all. But the use of the term and the idea of people's minds, then it becomes a harem scarum thing. Um, just for our interest's sake, this is the ice conditions two days ago, on May the 7th. You see the ice starting to retreat, uh, starting to melt in Hudson Bay. And of course, the polar bears are all down here um, waiting. Or, or coming ashore, I should say. They come ashore uh, around the Hudson Bay where they have their denning and the, the young are born. This picture on the left, because you see, you hear about the polar bears drowning. And this was a photograph that Al Gore used in his movie. The woman who took this picture was on a tourist ship in the Arctic. And she said the polar bears weren't threatened, they weren't drowning, nothing. In fact, they climbed up on this ice to see what was on the ship, and they saw food. <laughs> they are superb swimmers. 
In the search and rescue we did in the Arctic, I've seen polar bears 100 miles offshore. Why do they swim so well? Because their long fur is hollow. And it's hollow because it transmits sunlight down into the body to keep the body warm. Because it's hollow, of course, it floats. Next time you see a polar bear in the water, you'll see all that fur up. And of course, it just paddles away happily looking for food. But one of the things about the polar bear is it only appeared in the Arctic about 100,000 years ago. In biologic terms, that's yesterday. It is actually a modified version of the Alaska brown bear. And because it's so recently arrived in the Arctic and modified to a white fur, you find hybrid polar bears. Polar bear grizzly hybrids. And of course the Alaska brown bear lives on land. Polar bears live on land very well, thank you very much. That's how they survived that warm period I showed you when the ice was melting. So all of this nonsense about polar bears. But what happened? Canada, we call the Eskimos Inuit. That's what they wanted to be called. The Inuit have always insisted the bear's demise was greatly exaggerated by scientists doing projections based on flyover count. But their input was usually dismissed as the ramblings of self-interested hunters. How did that come about? Well, the US government said, no, you can't hunt polar bears in Canada. How they got away with that, I don't know. <laughs> but I can tell you the Inuit people were entitled to hunt one polar bear a year, provided the polar bear expert at, at um, Iglulik by the name of Mitch Taylor, if he said the polar bear numbers were adequate, they were allowed to hunt one polar bear per family per year. But very few of them did it. Mo what most of them did was they sold that hunting license. And they could get anywhere from eighty to $120,000 for that hunting license. And when you're living in the Arctic, that's a lot of money. That's a big income. Gone. Deprived. Completely gone. And Mitch Taylor, Nunavut government biologist, observed in a front page story in the Nutsiat News, the Inuit were right, there aren't just a few more bears, there are a hell of a lot more bears. So all of that nonsense about the polar bears disappearing is just that. And so, uh, and by the way, Canada had a polar bear conference two years ago. They told the Inuit leaders and Mitch Taylor, don't show up. They, they banned them from coming. What's the motive? <coughs> well, this is a guy by the name of Robert Malthus. He was the son of an aristocrat, and of course he was the third son, so he had to go into the church, became a minister of the church. The eldest son took over the property, the estate. The second son went into the army, and the third son went into the ministry. So they, they had places to put their children. And, and Malthus got interested in population. And he wrote a book called An Essay on the Principles of Population. Darwin took this book with him on the Beagle when he went on his famous voyage of discovery of evolution. You know what Malthus' view was? There are too many people. We've got to reduce the number of people. And the governments are not helping because the governments are giving out money to the poor. Right? They're helping the poor. They're helping those people that shouldn't be having children. Okay? So Malthus was really a eugenicist. Got to reduce the population. And what he argued was that the population would outgrow the food supply. That idea got picked up by this guy, Paul Ehrlich, at Stanford University. Yeah, okay, and he wrote a book called The Population Bomb. And uh, published, and here you see the, some of his predictions. The battle to feed humanity is over. In the 1970s, the world will undergo famines. Hundreds of millions of people are going to starve, including Americans. I think you got the other end of the problem, don't you? <laughs> I, wouldn't be, uh, I wouldn't be a judgmental Canadian and make any comment about that. But you, yeah, yeah. So, so here you see, smog disasters, 1973, might kill 200,000 people in New York and Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah, yeah thin, thin the herd. I like that. That's a good. Idea. I would take even money that England will not exist in the year 2000. <laughs> this guy's still teaching at the university. I mean, it's unbelievable that you can be that wrong. And then he said, before 1985, mankind will enter a genuine age of scarcity in which the accessible supplies of many key minerals will be facing depletion. A, an economist by the name of Julian Simon took a bet with him. And he said, I'll bet you, you pick any minerals and you pick any time period, and I'll bet you by the end of it, there'll be more minerals at a lower price. And Ehrlich took the bet. But he hired somebody to pick the minerals in the time period. 
and he picked this guy, John Holdren, who is now Obama's science czar. Okay? And Holdren wrote a book with Paul Ehrlich called Ecoscience, Population Resources Environment. And here's one of the things he says in the book. Indeed, it's been concluded that compulsory population, uh, pop compulsory population control laws, even including laws requiring compulsory abortion, could be sustained under the existing constitution. So how could that be? But here's the game. Here's the game. Many years ago, H.L. Mencken, who I used to think was far too cynical, but as I get older, I realize was very wise. <laughs> H.L. Mencken said that the urge to save the planet is almost always a false front for the urge to rule. Yeah. Okay? And in order to justify doing what mo under normal circumstances people would say, you can't do that. Forced abortions? What kind of a state do you think we're living in? But look what he says. Under the existing, if the population crisis became sufficiently severe to endanger <coughs> society. Oh, we're doing this for the greater good. Oh, we're, we're taking over your land for the greater good. We're taking over your water resources for the greater good. We're saving the planet. You don't care about the planet or the children? What kind of a monster are you? See, that's the moral high ground they take. That's the way it's played. So you've got to look at, how do they justify this? And there, there you see it. Um, Holdren, by the way, was a promoter of eugenics, the idea that you select certain people. And then that got put into the Club of Rome, which was founded by David Rockefeller in 1961. And these guys, King and Schneider, said the common enemy of humanity is man. There is that theme we talked about earlier. In searching for a new enemy to unite us, we came up with the idea that pollution, the threat of global warming. See, they needed something that was going to impact the whole Earth. Because then they could say, hey, individual nations aren't capable of dealing with this. It's got to be one world government got to be a total world government. That's the only way we can handle this. It's a threat to the whole of the planet. That's the game that's going on here. The, cl the Club of Rome uh, uh, got, by the way, into the um, Agenda 21. We'll get to that in a minute. But here's the interesting thing. This, is this goes back to about 19 early 60s, at least. This is called the Demographic Transition Model. What it shows is that as your economy improves, your population declines. Okay? Why? Why did people have a lot of children in the old days? Because that was their pension plan. And they had lots of children because if three out of ten survived, you were lucky. I advise you all to read a book called The Weaker Vessel, which was the lot of English women in the 15th and 16th century. And when I tell you that Queen Anne had 19 children, and she outlived all of them, only one of them lived to the age of seven. These are conditions we can't even relate to Africa today. The average woman in the 17th century had 23 confinements, that is 23 pregnancies. And what they did was, the child was, the second it was born, it was baptized because they didn't want it to die with original sin. They baptized it because they said, well, this, this child is Elizabeth. And then if Elizabeth died, the next girl that was born was called Elizabeth. They kept using the name till the child lived. We don't even relate to those things. You don't understand what history was like and what it was all about. And by the way, Antonia Fraser wrote about that in a book called The Weaker Vessel, which was the description of women in the 15th and 16th century. But the demographic transition shows that if you allow economic development, the population goes down. And in fact, in those countries that are not allowing immigration, they've got serious problems. Because if you go to Japan, you normally need 2.6 children per family. Okay, I was the 0.6 in my family. <laughs> You've already figured that out, haven't you? <laughs> but if you have below 2.6 children per family, then your population rate's going to decline. Japan is about 1.3. And what they've got now is an aging population because people are living longer and in better health. And you've got a smaller and smaller young people to support that. Many countries, Russia, they're paying white Russians to have a third child. Italy's paying couples to have a third child. Province of Quebec is paying French Canadians to have a third child. 
See how political it becomes. Okay, well, we decide which ones we want, which we don't want. Japan is one of the most racist nations on the planet. It doesn't allow immigration. You see that I Aoki, the golfer, who's Japanese, he's actually third generation Korean. But they won't allow him to be a Japanese citizen. And so, as I say, when you look at, when you allow proper development, it's a situation in the U.S. Amongst uh, your American population generally, the birth rate's going down. It's being so offset by immigration. Right? You, you create, and they say, oh, we need them for the jobs, to do the jobs. Uh, now you know why. So this demographic transition actually is the solution. So you allow development, you don't block development. This is Morris Strong, a Canadian, who um, in, it was interviewed and he said, in the, isn't the only hope for the planet the industrialized nations collapse? Isn't it our responsibility to bring that about? He's a member of the Club of Rome. Okay, a very good friend of the Canadian Prime Minister. And he started all of this. He took it from the Club of Rome and put it into the United Nations. How would you do this? How would you bring about the end of the industrialized nations? Well, if you think about the industrialized nation driven by fossil fuel like the engine of a car, you can stop the engine of the car by squeezing off the fuel line. But if you do that, people scream right away. You've experienced that. The gas price of gasoline goes up, everybody's in a riot. Right? But you can also stop the engine by plugging the exhaust. So if you could tell people, hey, the exhaust from your engine or your industrialized nation is causing runaway global warming, and we've got to stop it. And what is the exhaust from that fossil fuel engine? CO2. So now we come full cycle around, why did they choose CO2? Because it wanted to fulfill this. Got to shut down the industrialized nations. And of course you see that's what Obama's doing. The coal plants and all the rest of it. And if you want to see the effects of what happens when you institute those policies, in the same year that he, be, he chaired the, the Rio summit in 1992, he became the head of Ontario Hydro, which is the public utility in, in Ontario, Canada, that controls all energy in that province. And he shut down the nuclear plants, he shut down the coal plants, and he built wind turbines. <coughs> and ever since, Ontarians have been paying a surcharge on their electricity bills. And they'll be paying it for 40 years as they attempt to catch up with the damage that he did. But he wants that for the whole world. That's what he wants for the whole world. And, and so this, this guy, I mean, he's got a lot, lot to, to answer for. Um, and uh, by the way, when, when Elaine Dewar, who interviewed him for her book, said, well, you got, that's a good idea. Why don't you run for politics? Well, he said, you can't do anything as a politician. I'm going to the United Nations where I can get all the money I want and not be accountable to anybody. But he's become accountable. Do you know where he is now? He's hiding out in China. Where he's saying China's the greatest country in the world. Right? Yeah, great, if you can live there on your billions. Do you know why he's hiding out in China? Because the US government uh, want, want him for fraud. Because he and his son, Kofi Annan, who was the head of the United Nations, and his son made millions of dollars off of that food for oil in Iraq scam. And we've actually got photographs of a South Korean businessman with a million dollar check being handed over uh, on this deal. So that, that's, and by the way, I should tell you, uh, there's a Canadian by the name of Conrad Black who was put in jail in, in Florida. Um, he's now out. He never did anything illegal, but he never ever in his life did anything that was moral or ethical. Um, but he gave the game away because they said, why aren't you in politics? He said, I don't need to be. That's one of those statements that's just a sleeper, isn't it? The more you think, I don't need to be. In other words, I can get everything I want, do whatever I want, not be accountable to anybody. And, um, and so, unfortunately, that's, that's the sad truth. Um, and here's, here's what Elaine Dewar, and I spoke to Elaine five years ago, said you should redo the book. She said, I got hate mail, I got death threats, I wouldn't go near it. Worst thing I ever did. She said, Strong was using the United Nations as a platform to sell a global environment crisis and the global government ag governance agenda. So that's what he did. And that's what you're suffering under now. In the United States, this is Senator Tim Wirth. He was the guy that put this on the political table because he wanted a scientist that would say that humans were causing the global warming. 
And he found a guy by the name of James Hansen who was working for NASA. And Hansen said, yeah, I'll come before your committee and I'll say that. It's not, not possibly true, but yeah, he said, I'll say that. He was rewarded by being made head of NASA GIS for the rest of his career. Okay? He, while he was a senior bureaucrat, was protesting before the White House, which completely defies your Hatch Act, which limits the political activity of senior bureaucrats. While he was the head of NASA GIS, he flew to Britain and defended four Greenpeace people who had bombed a coal plant. And they got off on the grounds that here was this senior American scientist saying that what they were doing was justified. But what happened with Worth? He said, well, we've got to get this Hansen to appear before a Senate committee. And so they set it up. And this is the level of corruption. And, and you, can, you can Google this on Frontline, PBS Frontline, Worth's interview. They figured out which was the hottest day of the year in Washington from the record, June the 6th. And they said, OK, that's the day we'll have the conf or, or we'll have Hansen in to talk about global warming and the heat, the runaway heat. But the night before, they went into the Senate and they opened the windows and shut off the air conditioning. So the whole thing was held in sweltering heat. And of course, what better ambiance to make your argument about global warming? That's this man. But guess where he's working now? Gave up a nice Senate seat. He's now with the United Nations. Okay. So when you start to look at, uh, we'll go through this fairly quickly. But here's Maury Strong, the political the United Nations, Rio, in 1992, um, and um, and then of course the scientific. They set up the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change to create the science that they needed to prove their political point, to focus on CO2. How did they do that? And I just want to, very quickly, I used to think that government commissions of inquiry were great ideas. Wonderful. Finally, we're getting the politics out of it. The first commission I got appointed to, boy, was I rudely disabused. I was appointed to be on a commission investigating lake levels in a large lake in Canada. And by the way, if you think people get angry about climate, water is a much more vicious issue, much more vicious. And, and um, anyway, we then got the terms of reference from the government for our investigation. They were so narrow that they literally determined what the outcome of our report would be. And I said to the chairman of the commission, Mr. Duncan, I said, you go to the minister and tell him, unless we get full access to all data and all information, I'm going to go to the media and say, you're trying to predetermine the outcome of this. Well, we got all the information. And guess what? I found out there have been four previous commissions of inquiry, all identifying the problem, all re recommending changes. None of them ever acted on. And here we are in our fifth commission of inquiry. But of course, you see, it's in those terms of reference that they control the commission of inquiry. But that's where the conspiracy theories start. What's the, one of the biggest conspiracy theories in the US? Who shot Kennedy? Kennedy inquiry. I was watching Judge Warren on ABC te television. And they said, well, Judge Warren, why didn't you look at the Mafia connection with Jack Ruby in Dallas? You know well, what he said? It wasn't in my terms of reference. And I'm sitting there thinking, I know exactly what he's telling me. He's told not to go there. But of course, most of the audience wouldn't know what he was saying. They wouldn't understand what was being said. That's how they control these things. Well, here's how they controlled the climate thing. By the definition, they were told to look at a change of climate which is attributed directly or indirectly to human activity that alters the composition of the global atmosphere, which is in addition to natural climate variability uh, observed over considerable time. In other words, only look at human causes. Don't look at what nature is doing. You can't possibly determine this if you don't know what nature is doing. It's impossible. So the IPCC were very restricted right from the start to only looking at human causes. And of course, that narrows it to CO2. So here they did the science report. And from the science report, they say, yeah, oh yeah, CO2 is causing it. We're 95% certain. So then the, the second group say, OK, it's humans causing the warming. So we'll look at the impacts. And these guys say, oh, you know, the polar bear is going to die. This is going to happen. All the negative things. That's all you hear in the media. They never look at the positive sides of warming. 
You know, there's Canadians up there saying, come on, warming. <laughs> you never think about that. It's like, it's like an economist doing a cost-benefit study and only looking at the cost. It's exactly what's going on here. And, and of course, then they corrupt it even more. Because here's the science report. And then, once all of this is finished, they keep that, they don't disclose that, they produce a summary report. And the summary report doesn't agree with what the science report says at all. Because it's produced by different people. And it's released to the public with all the scares and all of the false claims. And somebody asked me coming in here tonight, have you read the 816 pages of this summary? And I, yes, I have. And it's an unbelievable bunch of lies. Completely false information. And then they release this, and then this goes back to the scientists saying, make sure that your re science report agrees with what we told the public. This is like an executive doing a study of his company and then saying to the employees, make sure you find evidence to support the, the conclusions I've already reached. It's exactly what they're doing. It's exactly what they're doing. I love this. This is the cartoon. The other thing that's driving so much of this, of course, is the funding. This is Dr. Bagshaw, discovery of the infinitely expanding research grant. <laughs> the billions that have gone into climate research, just, just frightening. And yet they still can't forecast any better. Let's look at the data. This is NASA GIST, the number of stations starting in, uh, before 1900 reached a peak in 1960, they've been closing weather stations ever since. One of the reasons they argued was because of the satellites. But the satellites can't see through cloud. It can't tell you whether it rained or snowed or whether any precipitation fell at all. In fact, you remember when the first satellite images came in, here's the satellite. They had to draw the outline of the state so you could tell what you were looking at through the cloud, OK? And, uh, but they declined. But then they reduced the number of stations, but they selected only stations that showed significant warming. And so here's the number of stations declining, and then the drop in 1990. But look what happened to global temperatures. And let me show you how bad that was. Here's Canada. These diamonds are the only stations that they use to determine Canada's average temperature. Look at the Arctic. This whole Arctic archipelago, which is larger than the continental US, they got one station. For the whole of the Canadian Arctic. And I know Eureka, and I've been in there, and I've done studies with people. It's a uniquely warm spot in the Arctic. That's why they chose it. Okay. In fact, there are plants there that survived the last ice age. That's how unique it is. So when you start to look. There's a lawsuit that I've been part of in New Zealand. Because what every government in the world has been doing is been lowering the historic record to make the slope of the temperature increase look greater than it actually is. This is for Auckland Airport. The blue line is the actual readings. The red line is the government adjusted readings. And here you can see what they've done for the whole of New Zealand. They've done that for every single country, every record in the world. And when we brought the lawsuit against the New Zealand government, the New Zealand government said, oh, yeah, we'll go to court over it. And then a week before we were going to go to court, they said, oh, no, we won't go to court. We'll have a commission of inquiry. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And who did they choose to do the commission of inquiry? The Australian Weather Bureau, <laughs> who were doing exactly the same thing. So I just got one record here. This is Ruth Glenn. Here's the actual original, and here's the adjusted record. They've all been doing it. So they can claim that the temperature's gone up much more uh, than actually happened. The IPCC reports. Um, this was in 1998. Um, and, and I hope I'm not going on too long, but it's such a long story. And, and I'm very aware that the mind can absorb what the behind can endure. Okay. <laughs> So I'm, I'm conscious of that. But, but this, is, uh, this is one of the first bits of corruption. This is an upper atmosphere temperature record from 1955 to 1995. That's the actual record. Here's what went into their report.
they selected, this was done by Benjamin Santer, the lead author, so they selected this portion which showed an increase. They said, oh, there it is, it's warming. But look at the original record. I mean, this is so corrupt that you don't know where to start talking about it. And when, when Santer was challenged on this, this is what they had agreed to. I'll just show you, um, I think there's three here. Yeah, it, this is what they agreed to go into the report. All the scientists agreed. None of the studies cited above have shown clear evidence that we can attribute the observed causes to the specific cause of increased greenhouse gases. While some of the pattern base discussed here claim detection of a significant climate change, no study to date has pos positively attributed all or part of climate change to man-made causes. Any claim of positive detection of attribution of significant change are likely to remain controversial until certainties in the total natural variability of the system. That's what they were going to put into the report. All of the scientists combined. Santer went off on his own, and when he submitted the report and it came out, this is what he put in there. There is evidence of an emerging pattern of climate response to forcing by greenhouse gases. Completely contradicts this. And he said, the body of statistical evidence in chapter 8, when examined in the context of our physical understanding of the climate system, now points to a discernible human influence on the global climate. But these guys said there was no evidence of that. But guess what the media picked up on? A discernible human influence. That became the headline in the New York Times. Santer, of course, said, oh, I'm having a nervous breakdown. I can't cope. And he went off to Lawrence Livermore. And he's still sciencing out there. I mean, just absolutely amazing. Um, but we go back to this graph that I showed you earlier. This is the thousand years, the warming of the medieval optimum. And, um, this medieval warm period. This graph created a great problem for them because it appeared in the first report in 1990. And it was produced by Hubert Lamb. And of course, here they were saying this is as warm as it's ever been. And people like me were saying, well, what about the medieval warm period? It was warmer a thousand years ago. We had all this evidence to, su to support that. This is testimony from David Deming, who I've known for 30 years. This is a testimony to the US Congress, so it's given under oath. And he said, with the publication of the article in Science, I gained significant credibility in the community of scientists working on climate change. They thought I was one of them. Sounds almost paranoid, doesn't it? But <laughs> I, one of them. Someone who would pervert science in the service of social and political causes. So one of them let his guard down. A major person working in the area of climate change and global warming sent me an astonishing email that said, We have to get rid of the medieval warm period. We have to rewrite history. Can you imagine? We have to rewrite history. And that's what they did. And they produced this graph, infamously called the hockey stick. Right? And, and to, to be full disclosure, the person who produced this is Michael Mann, who um, is at Penn State. He is now suing me. I have a large lawsuit against me by him um, because I showed how they corrupted the data and what they'd done. And the interviewer said, what do you think about Mr. Mann? And I flippantly said, he's at Penn State, but he should be at State Penn. <laughs> no sense of humor. No sense of humor. And, and of course, by the way, in Canada, no protection of free speech. That's why the, false, the lawsuit was filed in Canada. You would never, I would never have had the lawsuit here in the US. If you want to get a measure of how valuable your free speech is to you, wait till you've been sued for saying something and you find out just how nasty it is and how bad it is. I mean, it, it was a flippant comment. In fact, we've discovered since that what one rap singer had already made the comment, but he didn't get sued. But what Michael Mann did was he used tree rings to produce this decline in temperature. You see the medieval warm period's gone. What's the mistake with this? Tree rings don't show temperature. They're precipitation driven. And he only selected one tree ring set which showed the declining temperature. But then they had a problem because the temperature on the tree rings kept going down into the 20th century. So what they did was they cut it off 
at 1900, and they tacked on modern instrumental record, which is completely scientifically corrupt. And what we, we got from the leaked emails, what they were doing. The com they instructed the computer to hide the decline. That was the phrase that was used. That, oh, we can't have that decline, so we've got to hide it. So whenever the thing starts to go down, plug in this data, and that'll make it go back up again. OK? That's what went on. And two Canadians, by the name of McIntyre and McKittrick, reconstructed some of the data. And of course, there the, the medieval warm period shows up again. And here you can see. But look at this blade of the hockey stick. That's instrumental record. This was produced by Phil Jones at the University of East Anglia, who was heavily involved in this corruption. And he, he claimed the global average surface temperature increased by 0.6 to plus or minus 0.2 in the late 19th century. So the temperature went up 0.6 degrees in about 120 years. That's what he claimed. But look at this, 0.6 degrees plus or minus 0.2. This is a range of error of plus or minus 33%. It's meaningless. It's like the, it's like the radio station. So I've done a poll for this, for this vote coming up, and it's accurate to within plus or minus 33%. But that's in the official report. It's in the official report. And when the Australian, Warwick Hughes, the Australian climatologist, said to send an email to Jones and said, he asked for the data. He said, show us the data. How did you get this? Uh, blade of the hockey stick. And this is what Jones replied. We have 25 years or so invested in the work. Why should I make the data available to you when your aim is to try and find something wrong with it? <laughs> I mean, people don't believe that this is going on about amongst world-class scientists. That's the problem. You know, it's almost like the priest thing that you don't, you can't believe and you don't want to believe. But that's the difficulty. And, and so, of, of course, and, and by the way, fine, and in the, in the leaked emails, Jones is saying, I hope they don't find out that they can get the data through freedom of information. And so they found different ways to hide the data. Finally, they, they got pushed hard enough, and oh, lo and behold, Mr. Jones lost his data. He lost his data, okay? And Michael Mann, of course, is now refusing to disclose his calculations of how he made the hockey stick. All right? He's refusing to disclose it. And uh, you remember the old math exam in school? Show your work. Show your work, right? Because you might have cheated from your neighbor, right? Very quickly at the end here, omissions. Uh, in the computer models, they leave out so much because they're only looking at human causes. I don't know how many in the room know this. This is called the Milankovitch effect. We've known about it since 1863, or most of it. The orbit of the Earth around the sun changes from almost circular to extreme ellipse. That's going on all the time, a constant changing, caused by the gravitational pull of the planet Jupiter, okay, or primarily by that. The tilt of the Earth is constantly changing from 24.5 to 21.9. Tilt's constantly changing. We tell everybody it's 23 and a half degrees, but that's just close enough for government work. <coughs> change, change the tilt by one degree and think what happens to the latitudes of you know, the Arctic Circle, Antarctic Circle, the tropics. The whole distribution of energy changes. And then what's called the precession of the equinox, the day on which the, the days and nights are equal length, is constantly changing. And you want proof of that? We have to keep upgrading our calendars because they're fixed and nature isn't. If you go back and look at the Hudson Bay Company journals in Winnipeg and you look at September the 3rd is followed, or September the 2nd is followed by September the 13th. The government of Britain in 1752 ordered to add 11 days to the calendar. Okay, there were riots in Britain. People died in the riots in Britain. And because people thought the government had shortened their lives by 11 days. <laughs> <laughs> Incidentally, I was teaching a course, and I was talking about this in, in a penitentiary in Canada, because uh, I wanted to have a captive audience for a change. <laughs> and I was telling them about how this 
year got shortened by 11 days, and I said everybody was angry, and one of the prisoners said, I know a group that weren't. <laughs> <laughs> it's all, all relative, isn't it? And, and, and so all of these changes are going on all of the time. They're not included in their computer model. Because they say, oh, these are long-term changes. No, every single year the tilt's changing. Every single year the orbit's changing. And you're telling me this is a forecast for 100 years. This is significant, but they don't include it. And they don't include this. They don't include the fact that cosmic radiation from the sun, the amount reaching the Earth, is determined by the strength of the sun's magnetic field. And so as the sun's magnetic field strength changes, cosmic radiation reaching the lower atmosphere determines the amount of cloud cover on the Earth. So it's like putting up a screen in the greenhouse. And I'll show you just this one graph. The blue is the low cloud cover, and here's the cosmic radiation variation. None of this is included in their computer models, yet we've known about it since 1991. These are major, major causes of controls of climate change, not included in their computer models. Um, the, we've known for decades uh, about sunspot numbers, and of course, remember I showed you that little ice age? This is another painting. This is uh, called The Great Frost by Jan Griffier, and it's the Thames in 1683. You see uh, down the middle of the Thames at a, at a medieval ice fair. Queen Elizabeth and her court skated regularly on the Thames. And um, you can see uh, St. Paul's Cathedral here, Westminster Abbey, Lambeth Palace. And again, the ice, as I said, was three foot thick that particular year. There's a coach and four horses out on the ice, so it gives you an idea. Uh, now, the last time that you had ice of any significance on the Thames was in 1836. Some WAG has said that the Thames doesn't freeze over anymore because they built the Houses of Parliament here and the hot air from the politicians. Is <laughs> but the correlation between sunspot numbers and global temperature is, of course, because of the cloud cover and the sun's magnetic radiation. None of this is included in their climate models. The current situation is, here's cycle 23, 2010. We're, we're down to sunspot numbers this year comparable to around 1800. And uh, so, of course, the Earth is cooling down. We'll continue to cool down because the sunspot numbers are declining. Solar activity is declining. And, and uh, we're expecting that to, to cool to at least till 2037. But what's the government doing? Preparing you for warming. Exactly the wrong direction. They're better to do nothing. Actually, that sounds good for government. <laughs> And so we end up with this situation. These are two cavemen, and it, I'll read the caption. It says, something's just not right. Our air is clean, our water is pure, we all get plenty of exercise, everything we eat is organic and free range, and yet nobody lives past 30. <laughs> kind of sums it up, doesn't it? Kind of sums it up. But of course, um, a lot of people want to go back to this, these conditions. I can tell you, having talked with Aboriginal peace, people all across Canada, the elders, they say, you're crazy? <laughs> the good old times? No, it never existed. And, and maybe that's part of the problem. Maybe we have become so successful, we've become complacency, complacent in what I call the complacency of superabundance. That people can't imagine shortages. They can't imagine being without. And it, it was brought home to me one evening when our power went off and my children said, we're going to go down to the basement and watch television till the power comes back on. <laughs> it is at that level of detachment for the young people, unfortunately. It really is. And so, as I say, I've, I've summarized all this, and I'm very grateful Ken Kaufman, my publisher here in Mount Vernon, has helped uh, with me and, and his good daughter, Stacy with this uh, book, The Deliberate Corruption of Climate Science. But I hope I've given you a, a brief insight there. I mean, there are so many other stories of corruption and misdirection, but at least it gives you an idea of why I talk about the deliberate corruption of science, because that's what it is. It's premeditated. And just like with murders, murders of passion are one thing, but premeditated murders are a t completely different situation. So for that, I thank you for inviting me, and I thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you for coming tonight. Our guest speaker is Dr. Timothy Ball, PhD. Dr. Ball has studied climate academically and scientifically for over 40 years. After spending eight years studying meteorology and observing the weather,